of Subscription E-Commerce Live. We are joined today by Jamie Levy. Yay, I said it right. <laughs> I just let it play back and forth in my head a few times. We were discussing the alternate pronunciation of that name. She is at Shopify Plus, and she's going to be talking us, to us today about dis- creating and growing relationships with your customers. So this, um, this show is always about subscription experiences, and we're super excited to have her with us today. The only promotional thing coming at you comes right now when I say that this is brought to you by Get Arpu. It's your upcoming shipment notifications um, tool to make them help you make more money and build better customer relationships. It does that with two-click upsells and delays, and that's available for recharge customers on Shopify and now big commerce. So find out more at getarpu.com. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Jamie. She's a head of engagement at Shopify Plus, and I'd love for you to kind of tell us what that means. Sure. So when I came to Shopify Plus, I intentionally um, created this relatively vague title, um, engagement can mean a lot of different things, but for the purposes of today's world, I work with my incredible team and create opportunities and experiences for brands to connect with each other. And as appropriate, the right teams at Shopify, which is sometimes the executive team, sometimes the product team, um, but largely around that peer-to-peer connection and just creating those opportunities for them to do so. I also oversee content um, and so have an incredible team that is um, creating different kinds of assets to educate and inspire um, for those that aren't connecting actually directly. Excellent. Okay, so your career, I feel like I did a little research and it has spanned both e-commerce and like supply chain logistics. So can you walk us through a little bit of what got you to your current role as head of engagement? Sure. Um, so I graduated college. I went to university of Kansas. I am a proud Jayhawk, um, with a degree in communications, which is incredibly broad. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, um, my first job out of school was, uh, I was a party planner for a large restaurant organization in Chicago. Um, And I wasn't great at it. Like my attention to detail at 21, 22 was just not really there. Um, And planning parties for other people wasn't that exciting. A friend of mine from school was a freight broker. He worked in the logistics business and thought I would really love it. And so he got me an interview and I started in that business. I don't know, I was probably 23 or 24. And I loved it. It was electric. Um, If you've ever seen the movie Boiler Room, like that's what the office was like. Um, People with like two, three screens. It was, so I started on the carrier side. Um, There was the carrier side and the customer side. The carrier side had boats, trucks, trains, planes, the the different ways and vehicles to move stuff. The customer side was working with the brands and customers that had the stuff that needed to be moved. And there was this element of matchmaking. Um, And so like, you know, finding out where the drivers were, what lanes they were looking to do, and then uh, matching them up with the companies that had the stuff that needed to be moved. Um, I did that for a couple of years. I took a break and traveled overseas. I taught some business classes at different embassies um, around the Middle East. And then I came back, I met my now husband, came back uh, stateside and moved to LA where I am now. Um, Went back into logistics and onto the customer side so that I could see the other side of the business. Um, I really liked it. I wasn't as in love with it as I had been previously. Um, I got married, I had a baby, I was on mat leave and realized that I really did not wanna go back into that industry. Like I wanted to love my job. I didn't want to and couldn't afford to stay home with the baby. there was somebody who I knew who was very vocal on Facebook at the time about how much she loved her job and was traveling all over for work. And I was, you know, a new mom with this baby. And I was like, I want to travel. I kind of want to get out of here. Um, And I asked her for coffee so that she could like tell me about what she did. It turned out she worked in e-commerce. 
she was like, I want to put you in touch with my boss. It turned out that like years before her then boss, um, was on the customer side when I was on the carrier side at CH Robinson in logistics. And so he had managed the Campbell soup account and I ran a bunch of their lanes and it was just like this, it was just like a total callback. It was amazing. Uh, he hired me into customer success at Magento. Um, I was at Magento for about five years and on day one was handed 350 accounts, just like transferred over. Um, and it was sort of sink or swim. Uh, I learned so much in that first year managing those relationships. And um, by that time, my son was like four months and I really did not love that all of the clothes um, that were available for him had like collared shirts. They were just like collars. I was like, my kid's gonna be like rough and tumble, like backwards hat, t-shirts, he's gonna be dirty all the time. And so I started to buy shirts uh and iron funny sayings on them from like 80s and 90s movies and people were like you should really sell those and so i started a company like kind of by accident while i was at, working at magento i built it on shopify um i got picked up by a showroom in the calmart downtown and so a bunch of stores started to carry them um i was just having them printed like literally down the street from my house i was doing all of the inventory i was managing everything myself um and it was just like an MBA in building a brand. Um, and it just helped me with this customer empathy. It helped me learn about everything, taxes, wholesale, you know, B2B, managing vendor relationships. And so while I was doing that, I was also managing this large portfolio. I then rebuilt the onboarding program at Magento and then went on to manage the strategic portfolio. Started having conversations. This is a very long, sorry. No, um, I, I love having it. Conversations with Shopify um, months before I joined. And Lauren Paddleford, the GM at the time, was like, We know we need you, but we don't know why. Um, and at the time, this was in 2017, Shopify Plus uh, was really starting to gain some steam. And they had some very large brands that were using the platform. Uh, Lauren brought me over to, uh, I collaborated with someone, we built out a team that was really like the MX black card for the biggest brands using the platform. Um, and so that was how I originally joined Shopify. I quickly realized that these brands, I mean, the velocity of this industry is such that like, no one really knows what's coming next. No one knows what they're doing. There's so many different variables. There are some brands that people might look to as aspirational, but they cycle through so quickly because someone new comes on the scene, you know, somebody sells, there's VCs, there's all of these different variables. And so I realized that these brands, they really wanted to hear from each other, like in the moment, it's not that like traditional thought leadership from, you know, the largest vendors or the forest or the gardeners, they also really want to connect with each other. And so I created some programs that allow brands to do that. Um, and then it evolved into um, a, connecting them with some of the right teams at Shopify, uh, sometimes leadership, sometimes product. And so we have a few different programs that um, allow existing brands uh, insight into our roadmap. There are different ways that we can make those connections to really solidify our partnership and connection. Okay, so you're doing for Shopify Plus kind of what we're going to be talking about merchants whose e-commerce sellers can do for, for their buyers, right? For your subscribers, for your one-time buyers, like building a brand customer relationship. And, yep. and kind of what, what I like about what you're doing is you're, you're taking it a step beyond like what is the one to one relationship between the brand and the merchant and saying like, who, what would benefit the merchants um, to, to kind of connect around like, so that they are, they're able to help each other. And I think exactly. that that's like so important in the fast moving industry, because you, you need other people to validate your ideas or to, to exactly. share their experiences and to help or to you. know where they've like skinned their knees, you know, whatever it is, because <laughs> people are trying a lot of different things. There's no like silver bullet. That's like, this is how you build a successful business, but it's also to take it out of just a transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, like my team, we sit sort of outside of 
traditional support, outside of traditional customer success, outside of sales, you know, we're really just facilitating these opportunities for brands to make connections. Um, and it's not transactional. There's no like, okay, mission accomplished. It's more like listening to what they need and then creating, um, I, I use programs loosely because some of them just aren't scalable and they shouldn't be. And what one brand wants isn't always what another does. Okay, so there's this phrase that I came across. This is taking me back to everyone. We had a conversation about her rainbow book stack before you all came in. And, and we talked about um, sometimes how you read the first couple of chapters, but you don't finish the book. And this is taking me back to, I think last fall, my husband bought a book and I was like, oh, I'll read the back cover and the foreword or something. And then I never, like it's, it should be read. It's sitting somewhere waiting to be read in a box from a move instead of on the blank wall behind me. But um, one of the phrases that like really captured me and I'm, I remember it like once a month or so is um, an author used this phrase like radiate possibility. And I think that um, that kind of resonates right now and feels relevant with what we're talking about and that brands should kind of own the role of radiating possibility, like to, to make anyone who is buying anything from you feel connected, not only to you, but as part of a movement. And so I think I'm going to kind of go out of order with the topics pitch, but I want people to drop questions in the chat. Um, it, as we go, don't feel like you have to wait till the end because this should feel like the meeting you want to go to every two weeks, right? Like that's what we've pitched this as. But um, I think that could get us into talking about the importance of building a mission that people can rally behind, that your brand is passionate about, um, that is like beyond the, the thing you're selling, right? I mean... I'm certainly not going to, I mean, we vote with our dollars, right? And now there are so many brands coming on the scene. I think cost of acquisition is higher than ever. And so like word of mouth and that like customer advocacy is so important and also like the cheapest form of advertising, but it's also, you know, you want to create people, you want to create the types of relationships or just connections with your audience um, that make them want to talk about your brand publicly, privately, whatever it is. And so, you know, the more that you can get out of those, like just a simple transactional relationship and create those wow moments or, but also leave the door open for your audience to tell you what they want. I think like those are the brands who are, who are truly winning today. And, and to go back to your, like, sorry, that point about no, no, no. The mission, you know, it has to bleed through in absolutely everything you do. And the mission needs to be like bigger than the brand. Um, there might be like, not mandates, but like um, a follow-up to the mission that, you know, there's a broad mission and then like, and this is how we're going to do it you know, and there are like different mm -hmm. like line items almost um, that roll up to that mission. Okay. So here's a good spot where I could say like, do you have, and I know you can at least through Shopify, um, but do you have like examples of brands that do this well, that we could talk about? Because I think what the people in this room kind of thrive on is when they have a few inspiration uh, inspirational uh, entities that they can go research and like look at and decide because it's it's interesting to me once you have launched something without a mission like the 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 challenge of adding that in and making it part of your identity if you launched without something like that so let's let's talk about people who do it or brands that do it well and then okay. I kind of inspire people to think about what they can do. So I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention that Shopify's mission is to make commerce better for everyone. And you break it down and it literally means for everyone, you know, those people that are thinking about starting a business, children who might like aspire to be an entrepreneur or, you know, have a lemonade stand. Um, Brands who are, you know, they just hit the billion dollar mark. I think 
it, it really is an all encompassing mission um, that, that I think is an incredible example. I was just talking to someone this morning about this company, Liquid Death. Um, it's water and it's water in a can. And they, uh, I'm a subscriber. I love what they do. Their manifesto, I just pulled this up, uh, says, we're just a funny water company who hates corporate marketing as much as you do. Our evil mission is to make people laugh and get more of them to drink more water more often, all while helping to kill plastic pollution. And I just, I like, it's beautiful. It's succinct. It's, you know, exactly who they are, that the, their tone comes through. And then under it, it says, but enough about us and our boring marketing story. Tell us about you. Um, and I think it like, it just opens up a line of communication that some brands may not have, you know, it's, I talk about this a lot. Um, like you shouldn't always punctuate your sentences. Um, and as like the daughter of an English teacher slash librarian, I, I feel like there's a, a very fast follow-up that's required there that like you should punctuate your sentences, but really leave it open. And, you know, I keep saying, using the word transactional, but, you know, you want to enter into conversations with your audience. So but, humanize your brand in ways that make that, um, distance between the buyer and the brand feel far less than if you were being very corporate and formal and exactly you know, untouchable. Them. Yeah. yeah. And, and don't speak like a corporation. Um, there's like a, uh, it's a fact. I was going to say like a story, but that, that Richard Branson um, in any meeting has, a, an empty chair and it's to represent the customer. And I think like, it's so important to just acknowledge that like, you're not marketing to either your board or the rest of your company. You know, they're probably gonna get your product for free. You're marketing to an audience who might come from Kansas. They might come from Mississippi. They might come from Los Angeles and they might be purchasing your product, you know, for different needs. I think the more ongoing opportunities for communication that brands can establish, the better that they'll be able to communicate. Like there's nothing worse, especially over the last week. I think we were all inundated with emails, you know, telling us about like their Black Friday BFCM sale or whatever it was. And it's like, tell me something like that I care about. Like it is so easy. It's easy for me to delete. It's just as easy now to unsubscribe. And so like I saw um, there is a brand called Dope, D-O-U-G-H-P, started by this amazing individual named Kelsey Marrera. And she, somebody quit from her team, tiny team. Um, they make an edible cookie dough uh, that you can either bake or eat. I am a huge fan of it. Somebody quit on her team. She had to learn Facebook ads. She wrote this like it's a screenshot of an email that's like someone from my team quit. I don't really know what I'm doing. We're having this crazy sale. You won't regret buying it. And it's like, that's how I would talk if I were in her position, you know? And it was just, it's just likable. It's not, I don't feel like that's coming from a brand. I feel like that's coming from a person. And there are certain points throughout the year, especially throughout this pandemic, when there's just been a barrage of emails, like at the beginning of the pandemic, um, around like April, um, brands were like writing, like, you know, like the founders were writing and saying like, this is how we are dealing. This is how we are modifying, you know, our warehouse, whatever it is. And there were some brands who like took, took a, on like their Instagram, they would film their warehouse and you would see the people that had the masks and they would be like, how's your family? You know, how are you dealing with this? And it was, it's just another level of, instead of being a brand and that, you know, like name, trademark, whatever it is, you're thinking about like Jamie behind the brand, who's working in the warehouse, who's going home to her family and has to, you know, like take off all the PPE and then go shower and then spend time with, you know, her kids who are probably having school at home. And 
you just can't have that layer anymore, like that corporate layer. And mm -hmm. it shouldn't all be buttoned up. Like this is real life. And I don't know, I think in order for brands to like truly set themselves apart, you need to have that empty chair. You need to think about like, how would I, it's so hard sometimes. Like I need physical reminders. Like I think about Richard Branson's chair. I used to keep like a hat. And like, if I'm really putting on like my merchant hat, like how am I receiving this information or what would I want to see? Okay. So this takes me back to um, Simple Focus Software, which is the parent company of ARPU. We also have Curated, which is like a newsletter platform. And we did an interview series and I talked to several people and I'm trying to remember who I spoke with, but um, had this great conversation about just the value of intentionally like understanding your target audience by actually having conversations with them. So this was doing like that in multiple ways for me because it was curating content and interviewing people and just the value of being like on the pulse of what their lives are like and what they are experiencing um, gives you in your mind, if you were the content creator, if you were the email creator behind this, or you are building the landing page or, or whatever your role is in your brand's attempt to forge relationships is that you then have someone to write to. Yeah. Like you have this placeholder in your mind of this exact person that I know this will resonate with because I took the time to listen to them and engage with them and understand them. So I, I guess what I might be getting at is that in order to forge these relationships, your company needs to be willing to invest in the research part of that, which is ongoing communications directly with your, your ICP. And ideally in ways that you can then scale that or repurpose that for marketing. And support, you know, mm -hmm. like it can help reduce support costs, but I think what some brands don't, they may not lean in initially is because the ROI is hard to measure. And mm -hmm. like, this should not be about ROI. This should be about building a brand with longevity. Um, and so like, while yes, it can lower support costs, you know, the more of those connections that you can make, the more accessible you make your organization, um, the less frustration it can help build advocates, you know, from a marketing standpoint, you understand to speak. Um, you can tell better stories. Uh, there's all of these downstream effects. It, it can also be like really difficult to measure, but I think it, it rolls into creating ongoing relationships and an organization that is going to last. Mm -hmm. it, it creates a sustainability because once you have invested in speaking with those people, then you can scale what what you learned from them to others, even if it's a cohort of other like-minded uh, or similar industry. Um, and they can represent, yeah, you know. And then X they become, them. yeah. So one of the programs that I created is um, these like small groups and, and they're connected with product, our product team and UX team. And so the product team can talk about different uh, products that are in varying stage of build. You know, they might be prototype, they might be ideas, but then the merchants get an advanced, you know, window into what we might be building or what we are building. They can give their live feedback. The product teams and the UX teams can then make decisions with, you know, a little Ashley on their shoulder or a little Seth, you know, on this shoulder. So when they're talking about the future of, you know, whatever that tool or product might be, they can channel um, and put on that, that customer hat, I think. Last week, uh, happy Thanksgiving for anyone who is uh, who celebrated. Um, I think it was the news I was watching, uh, and there was like a clip from the Butterball Turkey hotline where people could call in, and it was amazing. You saw like there were ten people in a room, all wearing masks. Obviously, still in a pandemic, they were at those little desks. It almost looked like a telethon, but it was like oh my God, those people are calling and they're talking to real people while they're making their Thanksgiving dinner. And I can only imagine what was captured on Butterball's behalf from those conversations. Like the same thing with, you know, 
sometimes I listen to our support calls um, or even like sales calls, you know, and you, you can just hear the conversation. Um, it's just one layer deeper that you can get into like really connecting on the human level with the individual on the other side. Okay. So I want to, I want to pull us back around from, from that research, actually influencing, if you don't have a mission established, how you would use feedback to determine what that mission might need to be. But before that, um, so let that like crock pot or cook or whatever. Um, but before that, we have a question Seth is going to ask from an audience member. Yeah, so uh, John Jackson uh, messaged in and asked, what role does creating feelings and emotions for the customer play when working with Shopify clients and businesses? Is there a pattern of successes of success for companies that seek to create feelings rather than sell a product? Can you either repeat it or put it into the chat just so that I can see yeah, it? It's absolutely. A, it's yeah. a juicy one. It is. It I'll, is. I'll, I'll do both and I'll break it into kind of the two parts that's in. This, so. is, this is the post Black Friday, Cyber Monday um, version of the Butterball Hotline. <laughs> <laughs> We're here for you, people. We're going to cook it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're good. Go for it. No, but say more, Ashley, because I like I like that thread that you were pulling. We're gonna cook it. No, <laughs> no. So I'm gonna read it out loud again. What role does creating feelings and emotions for the customer play when working with Shopify clients? What do you mean by for the customer? Or maybe Ashley or Seth? Like, I just want to make sure that I understand the question. My my interpretation of this, just because of the context that the second question yeah. gives is I think he means for the end customer. So for the product buyer versus the merchant. So when merchants invest in creating feelings, like have you seen that work differently or perform better than those who stay transactional? I'm gonna go wildly off just a bit of a diversion and I'm going to replace feelings with reactions and so like if you create a reaction you know either like you pull on someone's heartstrings or you um, entertain them like think I'm thinking about like Super Bowl commercials um, where people aren't necessarily like it might be brand awareness and I think that that can go so much farther than actually like selling a product. It goes back to longevity. It, it goes back to like meeting your audience where they are. And um, I, I like feelings better than reactions for this, but um, making a connection with them that isn't necessarily with the end goal of uh, a sale. And so there are some brands who, who do that really, really well. I think it all goes back to the story and the mission and having a human behind it. Like um, Jim Shark in the UK, Ben Francis, uh, their founder talks about like how he got his start. He was delivering pizzas and created this incredible brand that now people are like literally camping out when they have pop-ups um, and like you, you hear Ben talk about, you know, how he got to start and why he started it. And even if you've never delivered pizzas, uh, you know, like I think people can channel like that 18 year old self and, you know, really wanting to create something um, for themselves or, you know, seeing a need in the market. And it's like, that's one kind of feeling. Um, I'll always go back to founders and talking about like their experience and what's their why, um, because no one's coming out. Maybe they are. They're not the kind of brands I'm buying from most likely. And they're certainly not the stories that we're telling within Shopify or out in the market, but no one's like, I want to sell products. You know, like people see a need in the market. They want to make something better and if they tap into an audience that has a, that similar feeling, 
um, I, there's just like that immediate connection, I think. Um, okay, John just said for the product buyer. Um, is there a pattern of success for companies that seek to create feelings rather than sell a product? The feeling of connection is I, the most important and amplified over this past year because we are still, you know, connecting through screens. You want to be connected to a mission. You want to feel like you're a part of something bigger. And that's, a, it's a really strong feeling. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to think of a bigger feeling um, than connection and the downstream effects of feeling like you're a part of something. There are you can be a part of a brand community without having ever bought a product. Um, and don't ask me to give an example of that. But like here, I'm part of the Peloton community. I haven't gotten on my Peloton in four or five months. Uh, but like, you know, I'm, I'm a part of, of that community and it's probably not the best example, I think. I'd, I'd be interested to know from John or anyone who's on, like what kind of feelings have um, come up from a brand reach out or a brand connection to you? It, I, I will fill the, the blank air while people think about if they want to, to come on and respond or respond in the chat. Um, with this takes me back to like, some conversations that we had with Kristen LaFrance or LaFrance. I don't know how I was, I'm, I have like a reputation for like giving people's last names a different spin. It, it We're seems. all Madonna yeah. or Beyonce. You can just, yeah. Kristen. Kristen. So she's at Get Repeat and um, she, I think she did that Shopify podcast, which I can't yes. remember the name of. Resilient and, Retail. Yes. Yes. And so the, the takeaway from that that I think is is really valuable for this crowd is the the messaging from the start, right? Um, from the welcome email through to the first time the product arrives or the first time they have gone from one time to a repeat to a subscription purchase and the way you handle that relationship and the way you look at their engagement and segment them out if they are just not keen on getting one email a week and maybe you reduce them to a different cadence or you know you treat them differently as a subscriber than as a one-time buyer but the the emphasis um that i think we should all be going for is establishing relationship from day one of interaction wherever that interaction point is and then providing like not just content on the website but content in all the messaging that brings that person closer to your brand by actually serving them so teaching them even before the product arrives how to be successful with the product right and that's what seems like really um for subscription products sometimes when someone has subscribed say to peloton right you that person has made a decision to make a life change or to it's a, like an aspirational thing sometimes even right or i'm like 100%. in the jillian michaels junkies facebook group and i i connect with people in there because they're doing some things that i'm doing right and so i think that um giving them the tools to success and keeping them motivated to be successful is part of that subscriber relationship that you're you're building and maybe that plays into or is one of those pillars of your mission, like to make the world healthier or to give a certain uh, subsect of culture more confidence in, in their bodies or their health or their, you know, like, so like you'd break it down and then those would be the pillars of your mission and all your communication should be the same way as if you were a one-on-one -on -one coach with this person who was trying to make this change. And, and you're saying, instead of saying, buy more, buy more, buy more, you're saying, I'm serving you this way. I'm serving you this way. If you want to get the most out of this smoothie, you should 
you know, drink three a week to replace these meals, or you should do that, you know, like how to get the most out of the product and kind of like, that's the brand's role beyond like, that's the benefit beyond subscribe and save 15%. I think it has to be like, instead of getting the most out of this product, it's how to get the most out of the, the relation, your relationship with our brand, Ooh, because I it like can't that. just be about the products. Like there needs to be an, you know, an opportunity for maybe it doesn't have to be a one-on-one coaching session, but different ways for them to interact with not just the company. Like we know when you're just put into a campaign and there's a certain cadence and it's like, you know, but wait, you left this in your cart and you know, we are not bots and it's, it's offensive almost at this point. Like, especially I keep going back to the butterball thing. Cause it was just so adorable. Um, like if they're I, I, not even 800 numbers, like I loved when I love when founders are like, reach out to me, like we want to hear from you and brands that do their social really well, that have like really active comment sections and people are responding to each other. So then the brand can step back. And so like, if I am in some sort of, you know, an email cadence, I want to hear reviews. You know, I want to hear directly from people who have bought the product. I want those stories. I want to be able to relate to actual people who aren't affiliated necessarily with the company. Um, Just like people that have like... the best reviews are always like, I was totally skeptical or I never write reviews, but I feel compelled to do so. And it's like people who have turned into advocates and it's, it goes back to that peer to peer connection and you need to create ways for your brand to be more than your employees. Oh, I like that. Okay. So I think this bleeds really well into like what community really means. And this could get interesting because I am, I am part of like a conversation like this that I go to on Tuesday night. It's called demand gen live. And the people who go week after week, we are a community. We are active in this, the zoom chat and we like are active and engage with each other on LinkedIn. Right. But there is no formal community and they considered it for a while, but the problem was, well, then you need people who are willing to be active in this community, right? And suddenly when you like tilt the balance in that way to like, hey, you big super fans, we'd love you to like post in here three times a week, then it becomes yeah. like something that wasn't prompted because you felt a thing yeah. and was more so prompted because someone asked you to do a thing and the exchange is different and the relationship is different. So I'd love to kind of have you you don't have to give a definition because I think I I don't necessarily think there is a specific definition for what community actually is because I think it can be almost anything I think it's a buzzword like I actually Mm -hmm. hate the word community I think that it's overused I think that people can and it's a super controversial take like don't get me wrong I think that can be offensive almost to some people but I actually think like the concept of community um can be so many different things to different people that that word doesn't work anymore. If you're talking about, and it's why I'm passionate, so passionate about what I do, about creating opportunities for people to make connections without an obligation for that like recurring, you know, Tuesday nights, whatever it is, um, it needs to be at will and people Mm -hmm. can not just opt in and opt out, but participate when it, when it works for them, but those ongoing, um, I I'm going to reuse obligation because I, I just, I kind of think that it's garbage and sometimes uh, there are online communities, there are Facebook communities. And then like, people are like, Hmm, but am I giving away my information? You know, like is the metaverse, you know, what do they know about me or, um, there are, you know, Coros has communities, there are digital communities, but then I'm, I'm so interested. And this is based on what I have heard from brands, like 
they want to make connections. They want to validate their ideas. They want to ask questions in a safe place. And a lot of times it's not a safe space if it's online. It's not a safe space if it's being recorded. You know, like a safe space is the equivalent of a water cooler. And especially in situations where there's a group, a community of a lot of people, it takes a long time to get to that like um, place where you feel safe to share or to be vulnerable or to ask questions. Um, and so the, that the whole concept of a recurring obligation to a community, I think is like, mm. I, 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 it's the yes, I don't know. A, a good no, way no, to no, say that. no, I think it's interesting because I, I think for a community to be really successful, it has to like the brand needs to play a role, but it helps when there's that mission and you are just, you're the like facilitator of connecting people who care about similar things who want, who want to congregate. Right. So you can see examples of those communities mm -hmm. in social, like on a brand Instagram page where, or like Sephora has a, a great example of a community or um, like Glossier. Um, they're just like very active conversations within the comments, but it's not the brand. Like they might ask something um, or ask, God, I was looking at something on Instagram the other day and a brand was like, what's one thing that's always on your shopping list? And it had nothing to do with the brand, but it was so fascinating to see the comments. And it, it's just like, it's inspiration that may have, it may be completely removed, but you have made connections or interacted in some way with people because of that brand, even if they had nothing to do with it, they get nothing out of it other than um, activity, which I mean, mm -hmm. we all know because of the algorithm ultimately it results in more eyes and like there is a return on that, but it can't be so like contrived and it can't always be about the brand and one-sided. I think like to give people a chance to talk about themselves where and when they feel comfortable without like it being so scheduled is really important. Mm -hmm. I We saw success in like B2B tech um, for, what was it for? It was for like, uh, mega church websites, right? So B2B software for building out these websites for multi, um, like, uh, what is it? Multi-site church. Like, so they'd have okay. like five or 15 churches and they needed a website that could handle all of this. Um, we saw a lot of success in bringing existing customers and prospects who were all kind of thought leaders in in that, I hate to call it church industry, but they were, they were like really good church communicators at, at huge churches and bringing them together into like small scale events actually gave us a lot more information and them a lot more of a comfortable feeling of exchanging ideas with each other than trying to pitch them being in some thousand person Facebook group. For sure. Right? It's, like 15 people. Cohort. It's why, yeah, the cohort model I think is so important, but um, the evolution of my career was amplified by the fact that when I first came to Shopify Plus, uh, they would not let me create advisory boards. And at first I was like very disappointed, but the truth of the matter is the programs that have grown because of that decision have been so much more um, important in really building partnerships and, and those opportunities for connections instead of something, you know, where there's like this massive agreement. And so if you, if you create the opportunities for people to weigh in and to have a say and to speak safely about like either what they would like to see or whatever it is, um, I think it, it's very important. Uh, even if someone's like taking notes unrecorded on, um, you know, like uh, off the record. It, Creating it, a safe space. <laughs> yeah. It's so HR, but it's, but that's it's, what it is. It's so important because, 
you know, in today, everything lives on forever. And like what I felt about a brand last week may be completely different than what I feel right now. And yeah. so it, yeah, it goes back to those feelings and those can fluctuate. And like, we've all seen brands who have either done something right or wrong on social. Um, you know, like there's been this flux of like very funny conversations with, um, like some fast food chains and whoever's doing their social is like so on. And then I think it was last week or two weeks ago when Taylor Swift's new album came out and people were um, brands like using Taylor's version, um, just like capitalizing on pop culture. And it's like, it just makes it so much more, I don't know, like you want to participate with that brand in a way that you may not be necessarily voting with your dollars. Right. You want to be friends with that brand in addition to exactly. You want, yeah, there's yeah, an alignment, yeah. a connection. They make you feel a thing that you like feeling, right? We're getting into feelings. Um, I'm going to share a link right now, just because I think it could be relevant. And I, I returned to this article. I don't know. It came out last year. I return to it every once in a while because I love, I love Andre's take on things. Andre Chaperon and Sean Twing, they, they came up with this, um, it's not community, it's world building. Mm -hmm. And they position community and what your brand should be doing as what like a novelist does, which is creating an alternate reality in which your audience can inhabit. So you bring them into a world that they can live in or that they can come in and out of, right? the way you would to be open the book back again and be a part of that story or that narrative that's that's um, coming out. So I, I feel like this, I keep returning to when I think of how as a brand, we can story brand things a bit and be less the, the hero ourselves and more the guide to our customers hero at GAX. And, and that that is the world you are building is the one where they get to adventure and share in that adventure with others who are like, not 100% like minded, but fun to exchange ideas with, right? Like, I would much rather be with people who challenge me to think differently than I would with people who think exactly like I am. So you create these intersections, right, for, for people to engage in. And and I think that it's really important to note that like some people don't want to engage. Some people aren't interested in connection. They're not interested in being a part of a community. They might just want to buy something. And, you know, like as we've seen more and more CPG brands, like um, not capitalize, but uh, understand the importance of going direct to consumer um, where it might literally be about, you know, people just want toilet paper. Um, and you can, there's different ways that you can get toilet paper now. It's, it's actually like something that's so amazing as a, a, an example of a, a great subscription business. Um, who gives a crap? They um, are an incredible organization. I think they're out of Australia. They have a subscription, but they also have, um, you know, you can buy one time. Um, they sell toilet paper. They give a percentage of their profits back. Like it all goes back up into their mission, but they also, they have a personality that comes through in everything they do. They had at one point, um, like the wrap on the toilet paper was like a coloring book. Sorry, I have to let my guide up. Like you could color it in. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, like our kids, you know, like they loved coloring that in and their boxes have, they say funny things like nice bum. And so, you know, like you're walking your dog and you see a box in front of somebody's door that says like, you have a nice butt, like what a connection, what an opportunity to like laugh and be like, what is in that box? Even if I'm not buying it um, and it goes back to the feelings, but like that person may have just wanted to buy toilet paper and that's what they could get. And especially True. with the supply chain issues and everything that we've experienced over the last year, um, like consumerism looks very it looks very different. I think we think about mm. consumption differently. I think you saw like the stockpiling and everything um, and things that were just like easy to get and to run out and do 
now like we have this opportunity to do the research and figure out like who we want to create a relationship with from a brand perspective ongoing or not but like an opportunity to try once and and if that option is there for it to be ongoing um great if the option is there to connect you know on social or they send funny emails if they like make great recommendations or um, connections to things like sometimes Subaru is a, a, an example, you know, the charities that they pick every year, if you buy a Subaru, if you lease a Subaru, you get, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars that you can pick one of their like four or five charities. Like I have a connection to that brand. I no longer have a Subaru, but I like, I just, I love that connection that they have created for me. So, so I think maybe the takeaway there is like, don't, don't over pressure yourself if you are in the role of wanting to create connection slash community, whatever your definition of that is, that, that it needs to be massive, that you, you may have small cohorts of customers you connect with, and then you get feedback from, and you move forward with product ideas from, or you may have a larger group that is like self-driven almost that, that is huddling around your mission, but that maybe the key to community slash connection is to let it be what it becomes like to test, try, move forward and kind of live it out the way you live life. Right. Um, so we have Marco who wants to add something on if Seth um, would like to bring him. And then uh, if you have any questions, people drop them in the chat because we've gone a little bit over. I appreciate that, Jamie. Um, I've really loved this conversation. And then um, if you have questions, drop them in the chat or let Seth know and we will try to, to wrap because um, you may have somewhere else to be in five minutes. I do not know. Awesome, awesome. Can I, can I go ahead, Ashley? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, Jamie, thanks for joining us today. I joined this uh, kind of bit late, so I don't know if you discuss about that. But I'm, I'm a big hater of discounts that they are widely used for brands uh, by brands for acquisition and retention. But a big advocate of leveraging things like the need for status and social belonging with early access to products, VIP loyalty programs, and community. So, what kind of checks improvements? Uh, have you seen with brands focusing more on these things than just discounts? Um, it's a really good question. I think like a, a good, I don't know that I can speak to anything. Well, actually from a customer experience, I think just like lead with generosity. Um, I think back to, you know, discounts can cheapen things. Um, don't create a social post out of that, Ashley, oh, wow. but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's a time and a place for discounts and there's a time and a place for loyalty, but I think like brands that, um, are very generous, you know, if you look at the, how you measure, um, it's so important to be like, to, to do the long game. And so if you're looking for ways for retention, you know, giving uh, your existing customers an advanced look at, you know, a new product or including something extra in their, um, in their last order, um, really giving them a voice for what they would like to see, in my opinion, is going to create a stronger connection than a one-off discount. And also like we're greedy, you know, you know that you can leave something in the cart a lot of times and then you'll get an email the next day that's like, come back 20% off. And it's like, that's a fleeting moment. But if I'm being, you know, gifted something or really there's somebody who wants my opinion, they value me as a customer. They want to know, you know, what did I not like? Some of those are like, the best kinds of questions, um, but not when it's like contrived and it's like, we haven't seen you for a while. Um, like, I'll never forget. I, a workout studio that I belong to is like, it's been 89 days since we've seen you. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm 
fat, great. You know, like it was just, that's not how you want to open a conversation or start an ongoing relationship. I think um, if you look at what a discount actually means, um, there are other ways to be generous and to cut down, cut the cost for the consumer while also like elevating your brand and coming from a place of like a, a relationship. I don't know yeah, if that, that answered the question. No, no, yeah, that makes completely sense. To me, discounts just uh, uh, decrease the perceived value of your product. Uh, because yeah. especially when you got product positioning, you, you don't really need discounts. You can even uh, increase your pricing uh, because then you're positioning your product as the main solution in the market. And to be honest, like uh, what you're saying is really exceeding expectations uh, in terms Always. of uh, being generous. Uh, and for example, uh, that's the way of, uh, let's say, giving a starter kit uh, that in the beginning, uh, doesn't really adapt to your profit, uh, but in the long term, uh, it really helps uh, building that kind of relationship. And also like position in the market, you know, like you hear about brands who are incredibly generous with, you know, either their products or their return policies. There's that like old story about Nordstrom. There was a Nordstrom, I think in like Michigan that was built, I don't know, on an old tire factory and somebody wanted to return the tires that they had purchased and so they brought them to Nordstrom and they actually like accepted the return. I have no, this is like a, an old tale. I don't remember now if it's true or not, but like Nordstrom is on the map because of that generosity and that return policy. And it, it wasn't like something fleeting. People have stories about, you know, what they've done. I think um, Tony Shea from Zappos um, wrote an incredible book years ago called Delivering Happiness. Um, and Zappos really made a name for themselves for going above and beyond. And like, no one remembers a discount. I mean, especially in the last couple of weeks, like 30% here, 40% here, like it, it's all over the place. There are, there is a brand cotton, K-O-T-N, um, that did not, they explicitly openly did not participate in Black Friday because like, you know, even though they are brand, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, it like capitalizes on like, you know, overconsumption. And so they were like, you know what, we're not going to do it. And I don't know what impact it had on their sales, but um, there, there are brands who just make a conscious decision to not continue to drive down to the bottom line, you know, and like the discounts, again, they're fleeting. It's like, are you going to make your numbers this month? Or are you going to create an ongoing relationship with somebody who could potentially, you know, be, make uh, continued investments in your product? Yeah, I think we see that a lot from our perspective because we deal with purely subscription customer relations, right? And so some of the merchants who get the most out of ARPU are the ones who are customizing campaigns on first, second, and third renewal of surprising and delighting or asking for feedback or making sure that the, the benefits of subscription or sometimes it's, it's even termed membership, right? Are go beyond a percentage off to, to like a, and almost like a, what's the right word for something you can't feel or touch? It's like a, what's that word? In, like intangible. Yeah, like the intangible benefit of being a subscriber of this brand. Versus, and those are your those are your customers who have said, "Hey, here's my credit card. Charge me every month." Yeah, they're your biggest advocates. Yeah. So, so I like I like the idea of like it's it's not just a discount, it's an exclusive perk that no one else is getting. And, and they should be rewarded, but they should also be given the opportunity to um, say how they would like to be rewarded. You know, like maybe it is monetary, maybe it's advanced insight into, you know, the mm -hmm. next product, maybe it's, um, I, I don't know, like I, there are a lot of different ways. It depends on the product, it depends on the brand, but again, it's creating that type of connection where it's two ways and not just like, we're telling you what we want, what you want. We're telling you that like you care about a discount and not, you know, a connection or 
helping us determine, you know, where we are going to invest or um, donate, you know, like on Giving to Tuesday, I think uh, some brands had open conversations with their audience about like, you know, where would you like to see us donate this year? At, at that point, then you could think of your subscription customers as your preliminary or already existing, but un, like, like you haven't built a, a fence around it community. Like they, that is the group from which you can start to test how to best connect. Like, do I want to put in my next upcoming shipment notification a, hey, would you like to be a part of a group who tells us which flavors you know you want to see or which way you want the brand to shift or, or things along those lines so that you start getting the people who have already opted in to the experience of subscribing then further opting in and like immersing at the level they feel comfortable and I, I think people there are people who like may or may not want to amplify their own personal brand with aligning with something or mm -hmm. um, might like the, um, not allure, but like to be featured on a brand's Instagram or on their LinkedIn or something. And so like, it's not always monetary how people want to be like rewarded for their um, continued, um, I don't, connection with a brand or um you know like customer of the week or to do a profile on somebody to like send an email or to put them on the website like as as a testimonial or something like there are so many different ways that people mm -hmm. like to be recognized and rewarded that aren't necessarily financial or like you know doing a special like great customers who have really helped you either build your brand or help the bottom line. They've continued to buy from you, you know, like something that's not scalable, do like a limited edition just for them. Um, because the word of mouth and like what comes from that. And, and as people talk about those kinds of things, it's just, it's so rewarding on all levels. Love it. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. We have gone a little over, but it has been fantastic. I feel like we're our own little connected, not community. Maybe we are our own world <laughs> for this little um, point in time. Uh, Jamie, where can people find you online? Uh, uh, so at LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. slash Jamie Levy. Also, I'm Jamie.Levy, L-E-V-Y at Shopify.com. Awesome. And then as a closeout, you did ask a question that I don't think anyone jumped in on, but I usually like to give our guests, um, who were so grateful that you came and spoke with us, um, a chance if you have questions uh, or a question that you'd like to crowdsource from this group um, that they can either answer in the chat or come on and answer. Uh, I think Eli from Olipop like, was like, hey, how do you like our product or, or things along those lines. So if you want to ask a question, feel free to, to do so now, or I send the replay email out um, on Friday. If you want to pop the question in there and people can like comment in the YouTube comments or, or something like that, we can play it that way too, if you're short on time. I'm just curious, like what's the, the last brand that made you feel? like building off of John's mm. question, but, you know, that gave you pause or, or made you feel something beyond, I need to buy this or like, yeah. Okay. I'm looking in the chat. I'm also trying to think myself, like, cause I, I have a lot of feels. <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, Lulu Lululemon, I, I got a gift card for my niece from them. And I, I feel like the way they made me feel, and, and this is like more transactional than super emotional, was just that they were super clear about like how they would notify me if she 
open to the email and, and things along those lines. Like I felt like I had a very clear understanding just from the communications that they sent that I hadn't just like sent this gift card into the ether, right? So that's like a small feeling, but I would characterize it as trust um, between me and them and that interaction because gift cards are weird that way, right? Like you want to know for sure that the person's it's, getting it and, and the status of things. So it's security. such a good example because I'm willing to bet that that has been modified over, you know, how, over time based on questions that they got, you know, from support or in on their social, whatever it is, people being like, I sent a gift card. How do I know if they received it? You know, and, and after a certain amount of times, you know, brands are going to modify their, their process or their systems in order to like, not have to keep updating all FAQs. It's like, meet your audience where they are. People want to know if people have opened their gift. Exactly. Seth, have you had any feelings lately? So I, I have an interesting one. Uh, so about a few weeks ago, I bought a pair of shoes from DSW, um, really liked the shoes warm for maybe a week and a half. And then, uh, part of the shoe broke to where I wasn't actually able to wear it anymore. Uh, the lace got messed up. And so I was worried based on their website, their, uh, return policy was strict and they didn't want you to return it. If you've worn it too much, I was like, no chance that they're going to let me return this, but I still tried it out. I went back to return it and the customer service there was incredible, super great. And so I went, I did a full 180 where I, before I was worried, I was like, I'm not going to buy shoes from them again. These broke so quickly, like this ridiculous to, oh, that was great customer service. And the next, the pair of shoes I bought to repair it was from DSW again. So I kind of pulled like that full 180 going from not thinking that they had great customer service based off their website to actually being in person and seeing great customer service. So an interesting one with kind of multiple facets. That was a narrative. I like the journey. <laughs> totally. And now I want to see the shoes. We'll do that next time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, I am literally wearing fuzzy socks because I can, because it's a zoom meeting. So I'm not going to show them, but, um, do want to show huge appreciation for you, Jamie, for joining us today, for everyone for joining us this year. I, I can't keep count. We've been doing this every two weeks since September or late August, and it has been kind of the highlight of um, my month because I feel like we're, we're learning so much. We're engaging. We are like a small come and go kind of cohort. And that's what we want this to be. We do not have another session before the end of the year. Just didn't want to like invade everyone's holiday schedules um, with this, but you can go catch Seth. If you wouldn't mind dropping the link in to the archives page, um, if you want to go catch the replays or even the short clips, you can do that through our YouTube uh, listening or through anchor through whichever, uh, podcast listening, uh, source you prefer. And, um, I would love for people to recommend other guest experts to come on. Um, we've talked recently with several like kind of platform, uh, folks, and I want to make sure that we circulate back in and, and talk to, some merchants as well. And because I think that there's nothing better than like hearing, you know, what worked or what didn't work from, from your peers or from someone who's like maybe two steps ahead of you um, in, in their journey. So if you have recommendations in that line, let us know. Thanks so much for joining us, Jamie.